Greetings. This video will be a follow-up to my last video, which I recorded as I was eagerly awaiting a visit from the son of the great cardiologist Francisco Torrent Guasp, also known as Paco. Guasp was the discoverer of the myocardioventricular band and is truly a legend, not only because he was able to prove once and for all that the heart is not a four-chamber pump, as most of us were taught in school, but is helical and is structured and functions as a double spiraling vortex. Many, including myself, consider his discoveries to be nothing short of monumental and firmly believe they should have earned him a Nobel Prize. If you'd like to know more about this incredible man, I recommend watching the documentary about his life called The Helical Heart. Don't be intimidated by the technical terminology because Guasp's discoveries are all very visual and you'll likely grasp the most important points without any technical expertise. In my video, Helical Hearts, Petrified Organs, and Synchronicities, I discuss his amazing discoveries, their implications, and also look at the ways in which they dovetail with those of the great Austrian scientist Victor Schauberger. For those of you who were hoping for video footage of our meeting, or perhaps an audio recording, I'm sorry to disappoint. This was our first encounter, and I didn't want to risk an awkward or uncomfortable situation by asking to record him. The last thing I wanted to do was put him on guard, especially given the unusual nature of the information I was about to share with him. Paco arrived punctually, and I greeted him at the door with a smile, but I also correctly anticipated that he'd be wearing a mask. The virus paranoia here is palpable for some, and I didn't want to risk offending him, so I did the same. I let him know he was welcome to take it off if he liked, but he respectfully declined, explaining that his mom and others in the family are elderly and at risk. It was frustrating not being able to see his face or his facial expression, but our communication went well despite the handicap. His eyes were lively and full of expression, and later, when we exchanged text messages, I could see from his picture that he looked just like a younger version of his dad. The fact that our conversation took place in Spanish initially made things a bit challenging for me. Fortunately, in my work as a chiropractor, I regularly speak the language and use basic medical and anatomical terminology with my patients. I've never studied the language formally, however, so I was a bit nervous at the beginning of the conversation. At one point I paused, trying to find the right words, and Paco switched to English to help. But I could see he too was struggling and decided it would be better for us to stick with Spanish. Thankfully, the rest of the conversation went off without a hitch. Paco seemed warm and genuinely enthusiastic to be meeting someone who was an admirer of his father's work. I spoke with him initially in the entryway wanting to lay a foundation so he could better understand what I was about to show him and not immediately assume that I was crazy. I began with the story of how my research started. I mentioned that a couple of years ago I came across some rather unconventional theories about geology, and more specifically petrogenesis, the origins of stone. And I became fascinated by the idea that some of the stones we see may actually be biological in origin. I made it clear to him I wasn't referring to the widely accepted geological narrative that tells us that the remains of dead creatures come to rest at the bottom of the sea floor and are compressed under great pressure for millions of years. The compressed matter forms sedimentary layers which are then pushed upward by tectonic activity and break off into ever smaller chunks which are smoothed and shaped by chemical processes, wind, water, and abrasion. To the best of my knowledge, this would be the predominant explanation given by geologists to explain the various features of the stones that I have found and presented. I told Paco I didn't believe this to be an accurate explanation for the findings I was about to show him, and that shortly I'd explain why. I mentioned emerging alternative theories suggesting that many of the rocks we see may actually be the remains of far more recently deceased creatures, which could have turned to stone in a geological blink of an eye likely due to some great cataclysm. Lastly, before opening the door to show him my collection, I requested he keep an open mind, reminding him of his own father's challenges with established narratives, and I told him that the reason I had invited him was because I believed that there were overlaps, literally, with his own father's discoveries. How many times throughout history have innovative ideas been cast out or branded ludicrous when seen from within the context of a flawed paradigm? Guasp was the quintessential lone wolf, working over 20 years on his own, dissecting thousands of hearts of numerous species in his spare time at his family medical practice, just a stone's throw from here. 
For decades, his work was rejected by cardiologists, and in some cases, he was mocked for daring to challenge the prevailing models regarding the function and anatomy of the heart. Paco nodded, agreeing that his father had indeed been ignored, and even ridiculed in spite of the irrefutable empirical evidence he had provided. One Spanish cardiologist in particular was seemingly ever-present with negative comments, regularly proclaiming his father's ideas to be ridiculous. I mentioned in my last video that I considered Paco Torrent Guasp to be the person who taught humankind more about the true structure and function of the heart than anyone else in history. But he was also forced to deal with trolls. Isn't it ironic that the trolls are the first to point the finger, claiming pseudoscience? Without any investigation, they grab the moral high ground prop themselves up with logical fallacies and claim, we must protect the herd from these dangerous ideas. This is heresy. While still in the hallway, I touched briefly on Roger Spurr's theories about mud fossils and the idea that fossilization, given the right conditions, can occur far more rapidly than previously believed. Roger's theory offers a plausible answer to the question, how could soft tissue petrify without undergoing decay? The answer is that when the flesh is surrounded by mud, it creates an anaerobic environment, which means lacking oxygen, wherein the bacteria and the larvae, which would normally eat away at the tissue, are unable to thrive. In this process, known as paramineralization, the minerals in the surrounding earth slowly work their way into the tissues as the liquids and gases work their way out. Petrified trees are a typical example of this phenomenon, but we're told that it occurs over many millions of years of time. Paco told me that he was aware that examples of non-skeletal soft tissue petrification existed in the fossil record, but like most, he understood them to be very rare. I explained that if some of these alternative theories are indeed correct, then the period of time required to create them may be much, much shorter, meaning that such fossils may be far more common than we previously believed and that we have collectively lacked the eyes to see them. Finally, I told him that I didn't believe mud fossil theory could sufficiently explain the findings I was about to show him, and that I had theories of my own that I'd share with him shortly. As I opened the door to lead him into the collection, I expressed my frustration with many of the videos covering this subject in which 100% certain claims were made about nondescript stones, often recorded with shaky and blurry video. My take on things from early on was that if there was truth to these theories, then it should be easy to find rocks exhibiting undeniable anatomical features, shining examples of what I have now taken to calling biogeology. In my Helical Hearts video, I shared the discovery I made as I watched Guasp unravel a heart, revealing the myoventricular band. As he rolled the heart back up, it forms folds known as sulcuses. Watch as he does this. And look at the lines. See the overlaps of the muscles as he folds it back up? These are the places that the muscle fibers meet and form the heart's chambers. I had an epiphany as I saw this the first time, realizing I'd seen similar lines in those exact locations in many of the heart stones I'd already gathered. It was a reoccurring feature I had missed, and I discovered it thanks to the work of Guasp. More recently, I recognized that a number of the rocks also exhibited a spiral shape at the base, the result of a spiral contraction of the fibers, extremely specific and not easily explained away as the result of some random erosion. I welcomed Paco into the main room, and I can only imagine what his initial thoughts might have been. He seemed fine as he took in the strange sight of more than a hundred stones, all different sizes, laid out on tables across the room, and thankfully he didn't appear to be nervously making a move for the exit. Not wanting to waste any time, I went straight to the best examples. Several of the largest stones show a large number of anatomical correlations, and I'd hoped he'd recognize this immediately. I began pointing out the most common anatomical features, such as openings for the pulmonary arteries, the isthmus separating them, the aorta and vena cava openings, a tapering in of the sides of the ventricles, a flattening of the top, sulcus lines, and of course, the overall harp shapes. These themes are the most common and easily spotted once you've learned the basic heart anatomy. 
As he was already aware, heart shapes can vary widely depending on the species. I continued to show him around. Rather than think of these features as coincidences, I think it's far more helpful to see them as coincidences, meaning that they coincide not because of random chance, but because they are, in actuality, two different states of the same thing, namely a petrified versus non-petrified heart. I'm curious to know what someone who is a master of understanding and calculating odds, a bookie from Vegas perhaps, might have to say about these supposed coincidences. I suspect the odds of finding so many stones exhibiting such a high number of specific anatomical features must be astronomical. Given that a great many of the stones I have found also exhibit blood vessel openings in the right places and internal chambers as well, it greatly increases the odds against finding such a rock. While the mathematics involved in calculating such a thing is way beyond my capabilities, the empirical evidence suggests that such an analysis would definitely be warranted. My good friend Victor suggests that what I have begun to provide are the humble beginnings of what in mathematics would be known as a proof based on logical consistency. How many coincidences does it take before one must acknowledge a preponderance of evidence? The fact that the vast majority of these stones are also continuous, smooth, and unbroken offers further support to this idea, because the smallest chip or fragment in the stones is immediately recognizable, making it clear that they are not fragments broken away from larger structures. In my Broken Hearts Tell Tales video, I break several of them open in the field to reveal not only the chambers, but what appears to be petrified blood. Okay, back to my meeting with Guasp. After a few minutes pointing out to him all the numerous anatomical features found in the stones, I mentioned that my theory is that the heart shape occurs so frequently because, like all the muscles in the body, the heart goes into contraction upon death. This is known as rigor mortis, or post-mortem rigidity. This contraction in the heart causes the ventricles to curve inward, the base of the heart to twist, and the backside will either flatten or curve inward. You can see this in the video. The effects peak at approximately 12 hours after death and then subside when the tissue breakdown begins to occur. Paco listened intently to what I had to say, but soon found fault with the idea of the heart remaining in a contracted state following death. He spotted the anatomy book I'd placed on the chair, which I'd opened to the heart pages, and began to clarify that the heart does not remain in contraction when dead, but, as can be seen in the video of his father performing a dissection, the heart is rather soft and malleable once removed from the body. In Paco's mind, this meant that it was impossible that it would take on the form that I was describing. I hadn't yet explained to him that I suspected that the petrification process likely occurs very quickly, perhaps in as little as hours, and most likely involves either extreme heat and pressure or some sort of a monumental electrical or plasma event. Anyone who has ever used a TENS machine or been hit by a taser knows what electricity does to muscle fibers. I asked Paco if he was familiar with the works of Victor Schauberger and how they related to his father's work, but to my surprise he'd not heard of the Austrian scientist. I wonder if his father came across Schauberger or learned of his many discoveries. The overlaps between their work are surely many. I also mentioned the works of Girolamo Segato, the early 1800s scientist who held the secret to the petrification of all kinds of flesh. While the secret of his technique died with him, the irrefutable proof of his knowledge can be found in museums in Italy to this day. I've also cited several other examples of rapid petrification which I go into in detail in the Petrified Titans and Organs Parts 1 and 2 videos. I listened with great pleasure as Paco went on to tell me more about his father's discoveries. Though he himself is not a medical doctor, given his heritage, I wasn't at all surprised to see that he possessed a solid knowledge of heart anatomy, especially as it pertained to his father's discoveries. He told me stories about his father's research and all the years he worked on his own dissecting thousands of hearts, attempting to solve the conundrum of how such a little pump could possibly supply the body's estimated 60,000 miles of blood vessels. He told me of the difficulty his father had, already as a student at the University of Salamanca, in accepting the prevailing cardiological paradigm. That such a tiny pump could accomplish so much, pushing our viscous blood through a vast array of ever-narrowing blood vessels, 
was a model that made no sense to him. It took more than 20 years before the profession finally caught up to him, recognizing his discoveries and contributions. The high point of his career came when he was asked to perform a dissection on stage in Madrid for a room full of his peers. As he finished, you could have heard a pin drop. There was a prolonged, uncomfortable silence. But the ice was finally broken by the great American cardiologist Gerald Buckberg. He stood and began clapping enthusiastically. The room broke into a thunderous applause and standing ovations. His work had finally been recognized by experts in the field of cardiology. That the event occurred in his homeland was the icing on the cake. Buckberg was the first prominent cardiologist to finally recognize the genius of Guasp's discoveries and promote his ideas. You know, I learned about the ventricular band when I visited Barcelona about a year and a half ago, and I went over to talk to some colleagues about a new operation we we're doing for heart failure, and they suggested that there was something in Barcelona that had dissected the heart out and had some ideas about cardiac anatomy, and I had never heard of uh, Dr. Francisco Torrent Guasp. And he and I met, and the first thing he told me is that my concept of how the heart was formed was not accurate. And then he told me that the heart's way it's, the way it has its conduction that I understood is probably not accurate. And in fact, the heart's a rope. And I think that I heard something like that, and I said, that's really amazing. I, I can't believe it. But uh, he then showed us exactly how the heart was formed and, and had reduced it in its simplest possible category. And I said, that's truly amazing, because he had dissected segments of heart, and he showed us that his concept of a rope was, was very appropriate. But here in Spain, Guasp's ideas for decades had been rejected by his fellow cardiologists. It was the perfect example of the classic phrase, no man is a prophet in his own land. The two apical segments loop in a helical fashion, forming the apex of the heart, which reveals itself to belong to the left ventricle. When I looked at the heart, the first time I saw a circumferential basal loop, and then I saw a descending limb and an ascending limb. And they curled around each other, had a helix, and had a vortex at the tip of the ventricle. And the angles at which they go was about 60 degrees, 60 degrees going down and 60 degrees going up, and they cross each other in that way. And for years, people had wondered why that happened in the septum, why the heart looked that way. And I realized this was really a, a spiral, and I began to think about spirals, and I began to understand that uh, the spirals are almost the, uh, the master plan of nature in terms of structure and in terms of rhythm. And if you begin to look at spirals, if you look at a spiral simply and pick the middle of the spiral up, you'd form a helix. And of course, the heart is a helix. Using a unique imaging technique to examine the architecture of the heart, a cow heart is first inflated with compressed air. Then, in a series of X-ray images looking down on the heart, the helical structure of the muscular band is clearly revealed as we move down into the apex of the left ventricle. Once again, notice how the loops of the band turn in opposition. Two reciprocal spirals merging at the apex. The spiraling helical structure of the ventricular band is a pattern found throughout nature. You can see it in the patterns of seashells, in the growing flower buds of a daisy. A ram's horn gets its strength from the spirals within spirals of its architecture. The spiral is a common formation at every scale of nature, from the DNA molecule to global weather systems, all the way up to the stars. You see this correlation between a spiral formation in nature, which is common in plants, shells, fish, heaven, all different areas, and the heart seems to be one part of that spiral. And so the design of the ventricle seems to be a natural design. That is, it's no different than many of the other spirals in nature. It's just that we just discovered it. Called a MUGA scan, isotopes along the heart are excited and change colors when the heart muscle contracts. With an understanding of the loops of the ventricular band, it is possible to follow the changing isotopes and visualize the wave of contraction that contradicts conventional knowledge. The recognized sequence is from apex to base, yet this method shows progression in an opposite direction, from base to apex. We've been taught in the past that the heart constricted and dilated, and we learned that from William Harvey, and it turns out that the spiral formation of the heart 
makes the heart twist and untwist. And when it twists and untwists, the twisting is for rejection and the untwisting is for emptying. So once you understand that formation, you begin to understand what you see on, a, on an example of how the heart works. And in general, we have in the past looked at the cavity of the heart, but not the walls. And with the magnetic resonance imaging, we began to look at the walls. And suddenly you understand that the heart has an apex, which stays still. And the way it works is that it, it, it twists and thickens and untwists and lengthens. And so our concept of the heart filling and emptying by constriction and dilatation as a transverse factor doesn't, doesn't really occur in the heart. What I always learned in the past was that the heart filled from the atrium to the ventricle by the pressure that, that was different between the atrium and the ventricle. And this was taught to me over about 350 years because this is what William Harvey, who designed the circulation, taught us. And Well, if you look at the MRI, you see two things that are quite fascinating. First, you see it constrict and shorten and thicken to eject. And then you see it change its orientation and untwist, and it lengthens, and the cavity of the heart changes its size before the valves open. And because of that change in the size of the cavity compared to the blood within it, that is the blood's the same, you create suction. And with the suction, you can watch the blood on the MRI get sucked into the ventricle, and you can see that 90% of filling occurs during that initial phase, even though the pressure difference is tiny. It's not a pressure phenomenon, it's a suction phenomenon. So with understanding the, the nature of how the loops twist and untwist, you understand two things. The first thing you understand is how the heart ejects and fills by suction. And the second you thing you realize, if that anatomy is changed, as we can also see in MRI, where the ventricle becomes spherical, the capacity to twist and, su and, and eject and untwist and suck is lost. So the patient with heart failure can't twist very well, and therefore he can't increase his output of his heart to be able to work, and he gets tired frequently. And more importantly, it can't untwist to suck the blood back. And if it doesn't untwist to take the blood back, it only can fill by pressure, and that's exactly what Harvey said it did. But it only does that when it fails as a predominant mechanism. And when it fills by pressure, the pressure in the heart increases, the pressure in the lungs increase, and the patient has pulmonary congestion or his lungs get full of fluid and he can't breathe. And, and the, the symptoms are related to the inability of the heart to do its standard twisting and untwisting, which the spirals allow us to see. Observe the wave of contraction as it moves across the band, just as Torrent Guasp had theorized. Many call it the cardiac dance, the twisting, pulsing rhythms of the human heart in motion. Now, for the first time in history, it can be understood as the sequential movement of the muscular band starting just below the pulmonary artery and ending where the band touches the aorta. The helical course of the contraction continues with a vortex or figure eight around the apex. Contraction of the ascendant segment twists its fibers, resulting in a clockwise rotation of the heart. Active contraction wanes along the band as the wave progresses. The spiral formation of the apical loop produces a twisting effect, causing a counterclockwise rotation of the heart, including the apex, which remains in a fixed position. The shortening and twisting of the apical loop squeezes the ventricular cavity to raise pressure and opens the aortic valve to eject blood to the body. The helical course... The torrent wasp myocardial ventricular band. The heart unraveled will change forever the way we view it. Such a simple thing like a rope like a muscular band twisted like a rope that describes uh, a helicoid in this space, delimitating two cavities, the right ventricular cavity and the left ventricular cavity. This is so simple. Sadly, that same night, following his greatest success, Guasp returned to his hotel room in Madrid and died of heart failure. I mentioned to his son that several people in the comment threads of the video that I made about his father were suspicious of foul play. He said he too had heard such rumors, but did not give them any credence. I'm sorry to say I don't recall the reasons he gave for his certainty, but if Guasp's own son is convinced that there was no funny business, then it's good enough for me.
Worried we might run out of time, I steered our conversation back onto the subject of the stones, and I began to lay out my ideas on how I thought these findings could have come about. The most obvious questions being, how could these organs have turned to stone in the first place, and why would they be found in such abundance, completely separate from the bodies that originally housed them? My attempts to answer these questions are presented in the video Petrified Titans and Organs Part 2, The How and Why. In this first meeting with Paco, I chose not to mention any of the research I conducted on the mountain Mont Go. I felt the things I was suggesting to him were already wild enough, and if I brought up my research and conclusions about the mountain, he would most certainly have concluded I was off my rocker. Those of you who are new to the channel may not know, but prior to presenting these Heartstone discoveries, I already performed what I believe to be the most thorough anatomical and histological analysis of a Titan to date. To see the research, check out my Unveiling a Titan playlist. The first video was always intended as an intro to these ideas and an outline of the research to follow. The body of the findings are presented in parts 2 through 5, with a part 6 soon to come. Critics have and will accuse me of suffering from an overactive imagination. Others say I'm a victim of the Dunning-Kruger effect, or that I'm experiencing apophenia, a tendency to see connections and patterns between unrelated or random things. In their eyes, I know just enough about this stuff to fool myself into thinking that I'm an expert, and have intentionally or unintentionally ignored information that conflicts with my preconceived notions. The truth is, I don't consider myself an expert at all. I'm just a curious person who observes nature and is willing to ask questions we've been taught to assume are absurd. A more appropriate title might be a cross-disciplinary field researcher who believes that empirical observations trump theoretical imaginings. Having said that, if my conclusions are someday proven correct, then these videos may serve as an excellent antidote to expertitis. Are you suffering from expertitis? Do you find yourself casting judgment on subjects you've never investigated? Do you know increasingly more and more about less and less? Then try Paradigm Breaker today. Side effects may include perceiving the world with new eyes, increased humility, and a sudden willingness to consider possibilities that most would never dream of. <sighs> I've already outed myself as Looney Tunes on multiple occasions, and I certainly don't imagine that these ideas will be adopted by the mainstream anytime soon. And yes, in a room full of random people, I'm the guy that believes some mountains are elephants and that many of the stones we see are petrified organs. So take everything I say with a grain of salt. While I've never been a follower of a specific religion, I do believe in a creator and that God's fingerprint can be seen throughout all of creation. It's the vital force that keeps us alive through every heartbeat of our lives. And our hearts, little perpetual motion machines, are spinning from the first weeks following conception to our final breath. While I've not approached this research from a religious perspective, I can't help but admit that this has all begun to seem pretty mythical, perhaps even biblical. The two findings, both Mont Go and the Heartstones, while very different from each other in scale, are unified in the understanding that if either or both are true, then they must have been caused by some grand-scale cataclysm. Could it be that the stories of Medusa were based on actual events? Maybe this mythological character and others like Cthulhu are symbolic reminders of grand-scale electrical or plasma discharges. Who knows? Synchronicities have abounded throughout the course of these investigations. I see them as little nudges from God. One rather amusing one is that the name of the river which runs through this valley where I've found the majority of these stones just happens to be known as the Gata de Gorgos River. In English, this translates as Gorgon's Cat. Who are the Gorgons? Well, it just so happens that they were three supernatural sisters, one of them named Medusa. Remember her? In the Greek myth, Perseus cuts off her head and uses it to turn the Kraken, a titan, to stone. I mean, what are the odds? I concluded my presentation for Paco saving the largest of the stones for last. After showing it to him, he shook his head 
eyebrows raised, and conceded that there were indeed an astonishing number of anatomical correlations. He told me he found the theories fascinating, but he did not feel qualified to draw any conclusions and wondered how I thought he could be of help to me. At the beginning of the conversation, I mentioned that I had hoped he might be able to put me in touch with a cardiologist, preferably someone near, who was familiar with his father's work, someone with access to instrumentation for analysis and an open mind. My hope was that a cardiologist would more readily recognize the anatomy than any geologist would. And, if were someone familiar with his father's work, they might be willing to consider these unusual theories and perhaps even assist in the research. He thought for a moment, then explained that the cardiologists he knew were rather narrow in their thinking, focused on their specialties, and in his opinion would not likely be open-minded enough to consider these theories. I wish I could tell you my meeting with him was an utter success and that it was already leading to some sort of collaboration. In a way, it was a success, as he seemed open to the things I shared, stayed longer than I anticipated, and seemed to enjoy the conversation. We said our farewells, bumped elbows, and I promised to send him a link to the channel and to the documentary about Victor Schauberger. I don't really know what he thought about the whole thing. The communication went well, but I'm sure the subject matter was not what he might have been anticipating. I sent a message the following day, thanking him for the visit and for taking the time to listen to what I had to share. I told him I hoped he enjoyed the meeting and suggested grabbing a coffee someday when the cafes reopen. I could see the message was received, but he didn't reply. Not wanting to be pushy, I waited a few days and then sent another message thanking him again and inquiring to see if he had received the first message. A short time later, he replied with one word, received, and a smiling emoji. So what he may have thought about it all, beyond what I've already shared, I, I cannot say. I was a bit disappointed he didn't take the time to write anything more, but c'est la vie. My friend Howard was thrilled that I'd taken the initiative to contact him and told me not to worry. You've planted seeds, Mike, and someday they'll grow and he'll realize what you've shared with him. Well, that's the story of my encounter with the son of a legend. I hope you've enjoyed the video, and if you did, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Your comments make this all worthwhile. So, I hope you're all well, take care, keep your hearts soft, they work better that way. I found this one, which is already broken, you can see there. And then I turned it, and look at what it revealed. And that doesn't come out, but you can see if that piece was there that's broken off, which happened to reveal chambers inside the rock, that uh, it would have that same shape as so many of the other ones.